um, again, uh, just wanting to ensure that we're um, streamlining monitoring of that development of language early on um, to ensure better educational outcomes. Then the other, uh, the next on the who list is parents. Um, parents of children who are deaf and hard of hearing are specifically noted in this bill. Uh, Jackie Catter, our speech language pathologist, is going to share more about the role of parents as well as the parent document um, that's available as a resource um, through this legislation. I'm excited to have that shared with you um, and specifically uh, give a shout out to Jackie on um, her artistic talents that were shared uh, through the parent document as well as technical assistant flyers and certainly here in our backdrop of our presentation today as well. There is also notation of an advisory committee in HEA 1484, specifically an ideal advisory committee. Uh, it was a group of parents and professionals um, who have worked over the last year really to ensure that implementation of IDEAL uh, was in accordance of the law. Um, so Cindy Lawrence, our early intervention coordinator, uh, is unable to be with us today and so I'll be sharing more about uh, the advisory committee information in detail. Uh, the bill was added to Indiana code uh, that I mentioned earlier is tacked on to the code that's the basis for our center for the Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Education. Um, so it's really noting ownership and that uh, we as the center are really leading the charge for IDEAL. And then last on our WHO list here uh, is FSSA, uh, specifically related to first steps and children birth to three as well as then school districts uh, for children who are three uh, through age 10. Um, and so Lorenda Bartlett, our assessment team lead, as well as Sarah Kiefer, our deaf education coordinator, are gonna be sharing more about uh, your roles um, moving forward. So the what of IDEAL uh, includes a parent resource. As I noted, it's really a large part of the work that has been done, the foundational work over the last year. Uh, again, exciting to share this with you. It's going to be an excellent tool for you to be able to, um, in your districts, to share with parents of students um, or if you're early intervention professionals, to share with parents of children that you work with, um, for them to get lots of information, um, both that we've gathered as well as linked um, to many, many resources that are available. So um, that's the first year on the what and again a bulk of, of what has been accomplished in the first year um, of this um, legislation. Our center and the advisory committee has also come together to determine a list of tools and investments. Um, really, this list is meant to be um, uh, best to assist in annual progress monitoring of language development. Uh, Lorenda is going to share information um, about this list um, as well as your role in the legislation. Another uh, exciting endeavor for our um, staff and another way that we've been able to um, tap into some unique skill sets, uh, specifically that of Justin Perez, our visual language specialist in uh, video production, is related to uh, technical assistance. So we have uh, flyers and videos that are in production now. Uh, and Justin's going to share more information about those as we walk through our presentation here uh, and again to be available um, starting July 1st. So coming up. And then last, uh, the what of the document is related to reporting of those assessment measures. So that um, approved list of tools and assessments can be reported uh, and uh, we're going to share more information on how to report that information um, as we uh, go through our presentation. So then um, for the win, you may be familiar with this timeline. We did put out a one page informational flyer uh, back in 2019 when the legislation was first uh, put into law. So I'm hoping that reached uh, many of you uh, just again to give you some information related to this legislation um, as soon as it came available. Um, you'll notice, uh, again, as we look at this timeline, that most of those dates are, or all of the dates are 2020. Some of them have come and passed, and the rest are forthcoming pretty quickly. Uh, so it was really important within this bill that we had all of that, again, foundational work, the information, the documents ready to be put out to you all as professionals and to parents uh, quickly. 
that really within the first year, uh, we could be moving towards you all having information to um, really at your fingertips, again, uh, related to uh, sharing information with parents, uh, considering uh, um, assessment for language monitoring uh, and progress monitoring, um, as well as then um, how to report those out so that we as a center can uh, create um, a report of all of those um, uh, assessment measures um, annually. So let's take a look at all of the um, details of the bill uh, in more detail here. So looking first at the ideal advisory committee, uh, the law um, denoted both the role and makeup of this committee. And it was included in the law that the designation of responsibility to appoint the advisory committee uh, was on the center director. Uh, and I want to note um, that while um, that des designation was on myself, it was really important to me uh, to have inclusion of our staff and stakeholders in the brainstorming of how to appoint those committee members, how to get the information out, uh, really that while the um, onus was on myself uh, to ensure that it did happen, uh, we were a group um, come together to, uh, again, determine how best um, to figure out uh, that advisory committee and invite people to participate. Um, through, so through really advice of other states who have similar bills, uh, reached out to them in the process of our bill um, passing and just gathering information for those who had gone before with similar work, uh, really led us uh, to work through an application process. Uh, so again, there was an invitation letter as well as an application that was sent out um, throughout our state for anyone who um, felt that they uh, had expertise to share and would be valuable to the committee to apply. Um, and not just those parents and professionals who I had a relationship with or we as the center had a relationship with, um, but again, anyone statewide. So we put that out via listservs, uh, via our um, social media outlets and other ways um, and really had a great response um, of applications. We did send out some individual in invitations to those that we know we knew had expertise uh, that would be valuable to the process, um, as well as then um, sending it out statewide um, to gather experts. Uh, really brought a variety of applicants um, that led to a well-rounded group, um, uh, really included representation of those who had familiarity and expertise in American Sign Language, in listening and spoken language, as well as English uh, with visual supports. And I want to be sure to note uh, that these um, members of this committee uh, volunteered their time and expertise. It was really an honorable decision for them to make. It was quite a bit of time uh, and a commitment to, to put forward over the last year. And we are um, greatly appreciative of their interest and, and their commitment to the process. And um, just a really um, smooth uh, relationship and collaborative process between our center staff and this advisory committee uh, in, in the tasks that were assigned to us. I also want to note that many of the members of the committee reached out and sought opinion to those experts um, that they knew outside of the committee. It wasn't meant for the committee to work in a bubble or to perform these duties in a bubble or for the center to perform in a bubble, bubble but rather that these duties would include, um, again, a variety of perspectives uh, and inclusive of review and brainstorming with, um, with a greater group of people. Uh, it was uh, the size of the committee certainly did have some challenge uh, to align schedules as with any group work uh, that we do. I think these days schedules are quite full and can be challenging uh, to get everyone certainly even in the same uh, virtual room nowadays at the same time, much less the same room. Uh, and so it was uh, determined early on to have subcommittee groups uh, that that would be beneficial um, just to be sure that all the tasks were completed and accomplished um, efficiently. Again, these people were volunteering their time and so to be sure we could be most efficient with their time and uh, their resources, uh, we split up into subcommittees um, uh, to work on different portions of the tasks and then to come back as a full committee to review and provide feedback on all sections um, of all of the documents and tools. 
Uh, so um, one of the tasks, or the first task to note, uh, was in uh, developing the milestones, um, the developmental milestones. And that subcommittee group, I will say, had the bulk of um, uh, the, the bulkiest section of the parent document. Uh, and again, Jackie is going to share that in much more detail, but it took a lot of time and effort. Um, and so um, kudos to that subcommittee specifically for the amount of time and attention that they paid uh, to ensure that those language milestones in both English and ASL uh, were within that parent document were accurate and adequate and, and um, really parent friendly. They were very specific to that language as well. Another task of the advisory committee uh, was creating uh, and approving the list of tools and assessments. Uh, and this was a back and forth process between the committee and the center. Um, uh, so um, again, it was helpful to have a variety of perspectives uh, and experiences uh, within the committee members. Um, and so um, as this list was finalized, we wanted to ensure that uh, it was useful to professionals such as yourselves. And then the last bit to note uh, was the, um, while the foundational uh, work of the uh, committee has been done and, and worked through in this first year, uh, there is still ongoing review to do. Uh, and so uh, we just wanna ensure that these tools remain useful over time. We recognize that web links change uh, and really that our field is ever changing. And so to ensure that this information continues to be useful, um, both to parents and professionals, uh, we as the center will be at least annually reviewing um, these tools and documents and then um, at a minimum the advisory committee will come alongside us every five years uh, to review um, this information. So um, next uh, Jackie Catter is going to go into greater detail about our parent document. Hello, I am Jackie Catter. I am the Center's Bilingual Speech-Language Pathologist, and I am privileged to be able to talk to you about the parent document. I'm really excited for the go live date on this one and to get some feedback. As Bethany mentioned a little bit, the parent document it was a back and forth between the advisory committee and center staff. So the advisory committee would work on some stuff. Center staff would do some legwork. We would collaborate back and forth and um, bring it all together. It has four main areas. So you're gonna start with a general language, um, supports for language acquisition, law and milestones. And I'm gonna go into those a little bit more in depth in just a second. Those are all web facing. They're intended to be web facing documents that you can search as a full document, but you can also search the individual areas if you're looking for a specific thing. And they can be printed or, or downloaded if you are wanting to actually give a piece of it to a parent that you're working with because you want to make an illustrated point or something like that. It really is geared towards parents with very person-centered language. We try to be very aware of who's having babies now. Mostly that's millennials, Gen Z are starting to have babies. So um, we try to make it very visually appealing, something that would be used, not um, pairing back on what the parents needed to know, but also not overwhelming them with a big document of words either so that they would just not even look at it and, and put it down. Um, we, um, this was a year long project. So when Bethany says, I mean, we started in, I believe August of last year, it might've been July, but I think it was August we started last year. We, um, we tried to take a very positive approach. There is so much more that could have gone into this parent document. We really try to focus on what were the most important things to go on and then with the intent of supporting maybe further further things that need to be talked about with technical assistance as time goes on uh, for parents and for teachers and for early intervention providers. And that way we weren't overwhelming the document as when you see go live is quite a substantial document. It, it's, it's not small but um, we try not to repeat content that you could find in other areas. We just referenced those particular documents. Bethany, can I have the next slide, please? Um, okay, so I'm gonna go into the little areas and I do have my Google eyes right up on my webcam so that I can make sure that I'm looking up at you instead of like looking down at my paper, so. Um, 
we do have uh, it starts with general language and that is just like what it says it's general language so we're talking about language that applies to any language so we have a large burmese population here near indianapolis and so this is talking not about any specific language but how does language develop or the parts of pieces of language that are important for development regardless of what language you're using be it spoken or signed so that's what it starts with then the, the next part of the general language is talking about bilingual multilingual development and how those might look a little bit different if you have a child that's learning one or two or more languages and there are some slight differences on those and how you tell the difference between the language delay disorder and difference there are language differences for those kids who have more than one language and then we have um, some things on deaf children with additional needs in there for supports for language acquisition that is more in depth if you have a family that needs a little bit more information it has a lot of links in there of go here or find some more it will have like a small description and then go find some information here and that is something that uh, we need to, we will be checking frequently that's one of these to make sure there's no broken links you know how links will change and so that's something we're going to need to be doing on a frequent basis to make sure those links stay where they need to be then we go into laws and laws can be quite overwhelming uh, and policies for parents and that i think was the most challenging to uh, i think that was the most challenging while to do while or, while still making it parent friendly so we try to pick out not copying what the department of ed has already put out but focusing it on what children who are deaf and hard of hearing what is special to them about these laws and then referencing back to things that are already published by other entities um, for example what you know how do you get these services what is the process for a deaf or, a child who's deaf or, or hard of hearing to get some services and then milestones is the bulk of the document because we are doing milestones from zero months all the way to 11 which is as bethany mentioned more than any other law uh, state has gotten through and personally as a speech language pathologist i don't believe i've ever seen any one milestone document go up through 11 years so um, it's a really nice document it covers the receptive and expressive language in general then it breaks it down for american sign language and spoken english and then it talks about social skills and then print skills um, we try to make sure that we would pull out terminology that maybe parents wouldn't know in kind of a bubble or in a highlighted way so that we could make sure that we are still giving them the correct terminology but not making any assumptions that they might know something that perhaps they don't know what something means. Bethany, can I have the next one? <clears throat> So we're going to just, I'm just going to show you just a, a one page of examples for each of these. So this is one page of the general language document. And on this particular page, we're just talking about what language skills you're going to see, regardless of the language for children, um, that every language is going to develop and the age they're going to develop it. And so that you would have that reference, um, direct your parents to it. These can be put you know you can print out just that page and hand it to your parents you can put it in a binder if you wanted to do that and just have flip pages for those i think can i see the supports yes so here's a page example of the supports i just pulled out the literacy page oh um the general language also has tips lots of tips in there for parents so tips on how to develop various aspects of language at various stages literacy you can see on this one we have in the supports for language acquisition we have um opportunity communication opportunities american sign language spoken english listening to spoken language where it gives you a little um the visual supports it gives you a little description and then gives you links to go find out more information we have things about hearing 
levels. We have things about amplification and then various other things that the parents might need to know to know more information. And you can see we have just a small description. Um, this one happens to have some tips. It's got a little description of visual phonics over here and then it's got a bunch of links to help parents more with literacy. And can I see the last one? Oh no, that's not the last one, I'm sorry. Law, law, this is an example of law. This is just on the early intervention. We try to go chronologically with law where we're just um, explaining the laws. Then we start with early intervention, then we do transition, and then we do school stuff so that it's kind of giving the parents the kind of steps and the processes. But you can see how we try to not make it overwhelming with words. We try to be accurate, but yet clear about the different points of what we needed to talk about. And then you'll see on this one, is it a good example of how we pulled out definitions off to the side? We didn't make an assumption that a parent would know what a service coordinator was. We didn't make the assumption that a parent would know what early intervention was. So we tried to pull these kinds of things out for parents. And then our last one milestones and I do have to give kudos to this committee they worked very hard um, we at the end of this particular document is a page full of resources where these were pulled from and um, part of the last thing that the committee had to do was pick the, the most important because we could have had a twice as long document so we tried to make sure that these what we thought were the most important things that the kid needed to develop. That's not an exhaustive list, but it, but it was something. So you can see on the front page, these will be so that you could print a front back page to give to a parent. On the front page, you could see there is at the top, on the top of the chart is the just general receptive language and expressive language. And then on the bottom, it breaks it down to American Sign Language Receptive. Spoken English receptive, American Sign Language expressive, and spoken English receptive. And then you flip it over and you'll see social skills that will apply to both languages. And then you'll see um, print skills. And then each of the back has one tip for the parents to try to do with their child to help enhance language. And that is what the parent document looks like. Jackie, this is Bethany. There's a question real quick about Spanish. Do you want to address? Uh, the question is, uh, do you have those in Spanish or other languages? Just wondering. Do you want to address that or I can either way? Uh, we do not have this in Spanish. The milestones is addressing spoken English and American Sign Language. Now, Spanish milestones are going to be up within the general language document. That's going to cover Spanish. We don't have the document in Spanish for parents to read. Does that, does that address the question? Okay. All right, so next we're gonna talk about what probably a lot of you are wanting to know about, which is tools and assessment, and Lorinda is gonna do that for us. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lorinda. All right, thank you, Jackie. I am happy to see so many participants in this afternoon session and really appreciate your shared interest by joining us. My name is Lorinda Bartlett and I am the school psychologist and assessment lead at the Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Education, otherwise known as the Center or CDHHE. I'm going to go over some information on the assessments and tools portion of HEA 1484 or IDEAL. And of course, we'll be happy to answer or respond to any questions that you may have regarding the information I'm presenting at the conclusion of our group's presentation um, or during my presentation if I see your chat. So please jot down any questions or comments that come to mind, type them in the chat feature, or, or just go ahead and send us an email as we provided our contact information. The center staff, along with the IDEAL Advisory Committee, approved tools to assess and document progress as, as applicable pertaining to the spoken English the written English, or the ASL development of children less than 11 years of age. During the approval process, consideration was taken regarding appropriate content or administration for the chosen measures used with children birth to 11 years of age who are deaf or hard of hearing. 
Special consideration was also taken to evaluate the application of the tools that are already in use by our educators and providers, such as our speech language pathologists, as well as tools that effectively assess a variety of skills across the continuum, including those children with more complex needs. Now on our comprehensive list of approved tools and assessments, as determined by our ideal advisory committee and center staff, select tools were marked by an asterisk with special consideration for use with individuals who may have those additional needs or who may be considered lower functioning than their typical peers. So as we go live and you see documents being uploaded to our CDHAG website, check out that information and that entire list of tools. The proposed or the purpose of the approved tools, as stated in HEA 1484, our ideal is to annually assess, I said annually assess and track the development of expressive and receptive language acquisition, as well as the developmental stages toward English literacy. As we move to the next slide, I would like to reemphasize the fact that the measurements were strategically chosen as many of them are already incorporated into the child's early intervention services or the student's school-based programming. The providers, educators, and examiners already have access to or use the chosen tools and are encouraged to continue the best practice of annually assessing with the addition of reporting the results via our web portal per HEA 1484 or IDEAL, I-D-E-A-L. The complete list of assessment tools along with the corresponding age and grade ranges and brief descriptions will be accessible on our Center IDEAL website along with the links to their respective web-based reporting portals. The list includes the current editions of the following from benchmark and statewide assessment systems like AEPS or Assessment Evaluation and Programming System, for infants and children that many of you guys use in first steps, to the Fontes and Pinnell benchmark assessment system, Dibbles or the dynamic indicators of basic early literacy skills, I am, I learn, I read, your new I sprout, star reading, as well as WIDA for those English learners. So quite a few assessments to cover for the benchmark and statewide assessment systems there. With the measures regarding English skills, we included assessments with the advisory committee and the center staff to include comprehensive assessment of spoken language, clinical evaluation of language fundamentals or the self, preschool, the fifth edition, as well as the metalinguistic editions of the self, OWLs to look at the oral and written language development, the preschool language scales, as well as the test of expressive language. Again, these are not an exhaustive list. I'm just sharing a few of the tools with you all today. On our website will be the complete list. As well as ASL skill assessments, including American Sign Language Receptive Skills Test, or the ASL RST, the Sky High Language Development Skill, or the LDS, and of course the Visual Communication and Sign Language Checklist, or VCSL. Of course, the center staff are available to provide guidance and consultation at any time when trying to choose tools, administering the assessments, and reporting the test results. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. As we continue our discussion regarding the web portals on the next slide, I would like to emphasize that we have ensured secure data reporting through the projectredcap.org web-based portal system. Some of the entries include the full name of the child or the student, first steps ID or student test number, the test date and age at time of the assessment or when the testing occurred, the examiner's name and email so we can be in contact for any follow-up as needed, and of course the raw score, standard score, percentile ranks, age equivalents as recorded or on your testing protocols or through the statewide score reports that you all receive for your students. In accordance with HEA 1484 IDEAL, those who are responsible for testing or maintaining a child or student's records shall provide to the center the results of any tools and assessments as documented on our approved list found on the center's website. Additionally, the center is charged with preparing and posting a report, including data that considers the language and English literacy development 
without any identifying information like names, identification numbers on the center's website for those children and students who are participating. As we do recognize that parents may opt out of the administration of the annual assessment required through HEA 1484 or IDEAL, and they have to provide their intent to opt out in writing to the Office of the Secretary of School Corporation. So if that writing occurs, we're really looking forward to you all, and this is a crucial assessment process that was developed to ensure the progress is being made for these individual children, zero to age 11, which is why you come in as critical proponents to this process by spreading the word, connecting staff members, and educating parents by sharing our resources for IDEAL or HEA 1484 that we're talking about today and that will be available to everyone on our website. We provided a screenshot or glimpse of some of the additional web portal fields here, such as noting whether hearing assistive technology was used during testing, whether a listening check was completed prior to this testing session, if an interpreter was used for the test administration, as well as an open comment section related to the testing session, how the child did, that qualitative information. We don't just want the numbers. We want to see what you observe and how the child or student responded during that test session. Enter all the information in the fields provided on the pages of our secure web-based reporting portal. It'll be important to follow the instructions that accompany each individual standardized measure to ensure validity and reliability in the administration scoring and reporting. Feel free in the comments section, if you did not administer the test, if this was a state test, such as the NWEA, the WIDA, whatnot, and you did not administer it, go ahead and write that in the comments section. Especially as the teachers of the deaf, we have a specific area for you all to record the name in our portal. So we know who the teacher of the deaf is if they have one assigned on their caseload. Once you have verified accuracy of the information entered into the web portal, you can click to certify that everything is correct to turn the text box green, which will activate the submit button. Upon submitting the data, a short report will be generated that you can print from your computer terminal and add to the child's or student's records. The information gathered through the Indiana Deaf Education and Assessments of Language, or IDEAL reporting process, can be used to positively impact programming for our deaf and hard of hearing children and students across the state, maybe even nationally. Another critical part of HEA 1484 IDEAL is the technical assistance aspect. So I'd like to turn your attention to Justin Perez as he will now take the screen while I turn off my video feed so you can focus on Justin as he provides you with more detailed information and on ideal technical assistance. Also, Laura Leffler, thank you for voicing today for Justin. All right. Hello to everyone. Um, thank you, Loretta, for the introduction. Today, I'm going to give some discussion about the technical assistant aspect of IDEAL. First of all, my name is Justin Perez, and I am the ASL Visual Language Specialist at the Center. I've been there almost a year now. And with the IDEAL project, I was tasked with providing media, um, technical support through videos and other media um, venues. Um, with technical assistance, the IDEAL committee developed, felt like developing videos and flyers were critical to parents' understanding of the information presented in IDEAL. So we discussed uh, what would be the top seven priority list ideas for developing videos, which are shown here on the slide. Those seven topics are definitely not exhaustive. We can add to those topics in the future if we feel like there's a need for more technical assistance in a different area, but this is where we chose to begin. When we developed those, first of all, what we did was we looked to members of our community that were experts in the area for each topic. We got their feedback, we consulted with them, we, we developed some planning, we revised it based on what they had to say about what we had going. 
and works through um, the technical assistance. Next slide, please. We did develop some videos. Um, we thought, should we just do somebody signing? Should we just do somebody talking? We wanted to make it more engaging than that. We wanted it to be engaged with, to someone who is a visual language user or an auditory learner. And so what we did was created some animations. We have artwork, we have text and scripting. Um, of course, we have Jackie Catter who lended her artistic ability to us, and all of that is her own original artwork, um, which we put together with the expertise that I have in video editing to make some very powerful and visually engaging videos. Uh, they include music, um, they will include captioning, they have voiceover. So uh, it's all together in one, really. Now each video, um, is um, will be available uh, to be pulled up on on the website when it goes live. The videos are also meant to be in collaboration with the flyers that we've developed. These are the slide shots from the videos and the next slide you'll see um, the brochures. Next slide please. So here's some examples of the slides. Remember I said we had those seven topics? we developed flyers to go along with the videos. So the flyers could be something that's more of a summary. If you need an expansion, you can look at the video, but there's options for how you learn information. Or the flyer could be something that you distribute to other professionals, but they're meant to work hand in hand. This was a, a three month task, which I really enjoyed. Um, and I'm really I'm looking forward to being able to share it with the community and get some feedback. So um, thank you all for help uh, taking a, a minute to listen to me and um, I'll pass it on to Sarah. Thank you, Justin. I'll give everybody a minute real quick to um, unpin Justin if you had him pinned and then uh, pin an interpreter if you need that accommodation. All right, I just wanna, I appreciate everybody attending this afternoon. Um, we had a great turnout this afternoon, so thank you so much. Um, as most of you know, I'm Sarah Kiefer. I'm the Deaf Education Coordinator at the Center. So um, I oversee everything, um, ages three through school exit. And um, I have a lot of different backgrounds and hats that I wear, and most of you already know that. So you can, um, if you need to refresh on that, feel free to read my bio. Or, uh, or contact me about my background. Um, but it was so great to have all of these different perspectives from our various committee members come together. Um, we had special education directors, Christina Commons from First Steps, um, both itinerant and classroom DHH teachers, experts um, from the School for the Deaf and St. Joseph's, um, our, our language specialists um, in the field, um, as well as um, groups like Hands and Voices here in Indiana, and uh, wanted to give a special kudos or shout out to Patrick Rhodes. Um, he's one of the complaint investigators from the Department of Education, and we recognize that low incidence um, may not be his area of expertise, but he's always willing to learn and reach out to us at the center. And we really appreciate all the hard work that he did, um, as well as the rest of the committee especially on that special education law section, I had the privilege of, of being a part of that a little bit more. So, um, so great to have all of, um, all of these perspectives and our collective brain power. Um, and now we can kind of discuss a little bit on how we can apply IDEAL um, and how we can begin to put it into practice. We have a wide variety of children who are deaf and hard of hearing across the state of Indiana. So some children um, who are deaf may have parents who are also deaf and they were born into a family who uses ASL. However, our data shows us that the majority of our children who are um, deaf and hard of hearing are born of families who have typical hearing and use spoken language to communicate in the home. And this is somewhere between 90 and 95% of our children. 
So we have many families who have only ever known adults who have had hearing levels that may have declined as they age. And then there's a child um, who is deaf or hard of hearing born into that family. And that child might have a mild hearing levels all the way to severe or profound hearing levels. And it could be maybe unilateral, which means with one-sided or bilateral, so both sides. And many times their journey, um, those families' journeys with having a child who's deaf and hard of hearing seems very, like uncharted territory uh, for those families. And it's important to remember that if you meet one child who's deaf or hard of hearing, you have met just one child who is deaf or hard of hearing. Their journeys all look a little bit different. So although you might have two children um, with similar hearing levels on paper, their history and experience will play a huge part in their success. And they can experience very different outcomes based on a number of variables that you'll see here on this slide. One variable is the age in which they were diagnosed as being deaf or hard of hearing, or the age in which maybe their hearing levels had dropped. And, um, and then there's a big difference for children who have never had access to language from those who have had language um, access from birth or day one. And what do I need, mean by access? Um, if a family has chosen to sign with their child, has that child had access to sign language by native or proficient users of the language? If a family chooses to use spoken language, has that child had access to spoken language? And so the family may choose to use personal hearing technology such as hearing aids or cochlear implants, but it's important to know that we all learn language incidentally. The majority of language is not taught. And as you might know, when a young child says something that they shouldn't, that bad language likely wasn't explicitly taught. So the language or languages used in the home have to be accessible. There needs to be good language models that are in the child's visual field or their listening bubble for that child to learn language typically. So for our kids, their access to language, especially in the early years at home, plays a critical factor and will impact their overall brain development. The next factor to consider is personal technology. Not all children use personal amplification, but if a family has chosen to pursue hearing aids or cochlear implants or bone anchored devices, the amount of waking hours technology is used will influence their auditory access to spoken language. Again, if that language is being used within a distance where it's audible um, by the child. So all these factors influence the frequency and duration of exposure to language. So how often is the child exposed to language then where they can make those meaningful connections? Also, um, is the child enrolled in an early intervention or a school program to receive services from professionals who are specifically trained in working on language development for children who are deaf and hard of hearing. And if that child is enrolled in a program, are those services appropriate and provided with enough intensity? And as we all know, the amount of uh, family involvement plays one of the most important roles in a child's long-term success. The ideal parent document will assist in sharing pertinent information and resources to families specific to their children who are deaf and hard of hearing with the goal of increasing that family's involvement, awareness, and, and to empower um, the parent. So here on the next slide, we'll discuss adverse impacts. There are a number of hyperlinks here and I encourage you to check those out regarding best practices. Um, many times the assumption is that uh, adverse educational effect is synonymous with academic delays. But for children who are deaf and hard of hearing, adverse impacts can often uh, essentially be unseen. Access and language issues can create barriers to many other areas in a child's life, which will inevitably impact the child's overall success. So they are all at risk educationally, and that's why continual and regular progress monitoring is crucial. 
so their access needs also will change based on their environment or environments. Um, and so when they have that decreased access, it's going to negatively impact their ability to follow directions, participate in class, follow um, conversation with peers, and so on. And it can also impact uh, their overall mental health. Children need to start developing self-advocacy skills from a very early age. There's actually research that shows that by the age of six, a child must own it and be comfortable informing others about themselves and their communication needs. Of course, they need to be able to use those, that age appropriate language to start advocating for themselves, but those skills will need to be developed and built upon as a child ages. And those skills will need to be explicitly taught. Um, our children also experience more fatigue due to increased effort, auditorily and or visually, um, to access their environment. Children who are deaf and hard of hearing in a mainstream setting will have to work much harder than their peers who have normal hearing levels in that same environment. So all of these functional performance issues must be considered and reviewed regularly when developing appropriate services, um, programming, and having conversations about educational settings and placement for our children who are deaf and hard of hearing. On the next slide here, you'll see a graphic that illustrates how kids should develop. They're a lot like building blocks. You master one skill and then you're able to build upon that skill. Um, and children who do not have access or who aren't consistently exposed to language, whether it be spoken or signed or a combination of the two, will have holes in their walls uh, compared to their typical peers. Their walls may be just as tall as their peers, but they may be missing parts and have splintered skills or what we like to call the Swiss cheese effect. They'll have some areas that are lower and some that are higher. And our norm reference test scores might even indicate that they don't have an overall delay. But it's important for our children um, to review each of those subtests individually. The test as a whole might lead you to believe that they're functioning within normal limits but you have to break down each of those areas because if they have one low subtest, research shows that that is cause for concern as our children might have uh, missed those crucial building blocks and then that puts them at risk. It's important to note um, that the factors from the previous slide will vary over time. So to combat this, children need ongoing assessment and progress monitoring, as well as intense language in intervention to close any existing language gaps quickly. We recognize that um, not all children will have language gaps, but IDEAL is just one way to ensure that kids maintain the course and are regularly monitored. And we know that some kids look really good upon transitioning into school and then will slip backwards because they've never had that experience in school before. And unfortunately, if we don't put something in place to make sure that that trajectory keeps heading in the right direction, we could be doing a disservice to our students, which ultimately impacts child find. So this is why IDEAL was established. IDEAL is intended for all children, regardless of whether or not they have an IFSP, an IEP, a 504 plan or no services at all. So you'll see on the next slide that IDEAL aligns with national best practices and I've provided a great resource there for you to dig into. However, you may have just participated in Cheryl and Barbara's uh, presentations and if so, they really went over um, this guidance from the National Association of State Directors of Special Education, and it, it has been updated just recently. So um, I think this is the third edition, so all of this is very relevant for today. So really, children um, who are deaf and hard of hearing should have annual language assessments until they're deemed language proficient, recognizing that our ideal goes through the age of 10, but really, if, if you're at age 10 or 11 and that child isn't language proficient, it would be best practice to continue having 
um, regular language assessments. Those assessments will drive your goals and then goals drive uh, language therapy and instruction and then regular progress monitoring ensures that any gaps are closing while no additional gaps are forming. I remember I had a student um, one time who had lower scores in one area and we had goals and services catered to close that gap. And I was really pleasantly surprised to see within a year's time that he made over a year's worth of progress and was well above average when assessed in that area. But the problem was that everyone was so hyper-focused on that weak area um, that through assessment, we found that he actually slipped in a couple of other areas. And he had such good compensatory skills that without having ongoing assessment, we might not have caught those weaker areas until there was a more significant problem. And then of course, when there is a more significant problem, we would have had to increase our service time, our money, our resources, and it just goes exponentially from there in order to get him caught back up. Our kids are super smart and they can look really good and fool you if you're not careful. So that's why we need those regular assessments to determine if there are any gaps that might be forming. So, but not only should we look at how our children perform on assessments in sterile, distraction-free environments, but we need to ensure that we know how they are functioning in, in all various environments. Um, and so you might have heard me this morning, <laughs> I really uh, talked a lot about um, conducting functional performance assessments. Um, and I have done many of these over the years and I can tell you that that baseline data from assessment is just one piece of the puzzle. We have to have functional data to determine how kids perform in their regular day-to-day -day environments um, using any related services such as interpreting um, or CART even and then also maybe even using their personal hearing devices or other auxiliary aids such as hearing assistive technologies like FM and GM systems. If you need more resources on how to perform a functional performance observation feel free to reach out. I love doing them. Um, and I have done them in many, many, many different environments, um, including virtually. So uh, feel free to reach out if you need any of those uh, resources. You'll see on the next slide here that ideal assessments are essentially conducted outside of assessments that are used to determine eligibility for special education services. However, those assessments can certainly be used. So in fact, um, giving those uh, assessments regularly might also throw a red flag of any additional concerns that might need to be monitored. Children who have typical hearing, who might have a low average uh, language uh, skill, can begin to catch up with their peers if they're exposed to a dynamic environment. But given that same situation for our children who are deaf and hard of hearing, that might not be intense enough to get them caught up at the same rate as their typical peers. So in fact, our research shows that once our children enter school, their rate of learning actually declines due to increased issues in clearly accessing communication. That's why it's crucial to regularly assess and adjust instructional practices to ensure any gaps are uh, closing and then we have no new ones developing. So anytime a child is assessed with one of uh, these assessments, early intervention professionals and school staff will enter um, that into the portal as Lorinda discussed, and then we'll receive, or you'll receive a report to track uh, the child's progress. And the center will also review that data and will be available to provide resources, information and technical assistance to ensure that those children, our children who are deaf and hard of hearing are on par with their typical peers. This longitudinal data should drive conversations to develop appropriate services and programming as needed. And to put some of this into perspective, did you know that many of you have already had a demonstration of what it's like to have mild hearing levels late just recently? Yes, um, by wearing masks and social distancing, 
have you found that it might be a little bit challenging uh, to communicate with anyone while wearing a mask? And here you are as proficient language users. So think about um, what it might be like to communicate in this way all the time. Our um, masks are actually a, a wonderful demonstration of mild hearing loss and especially um, having a, more of a higher frequency. Um, those higher frequencies drop off when you have a mask. So, um, so think about that a little bit. Um, and unfortunately, I think that masks are in our reality for the foreseeable future. And so it impacts everybody, right? So even people who have typical hearing levels, they're impacted by masks. So just think about how that also exponentially impacts our, our kiddos. So think about to your access in various environments with, a, with masks and social distancing. How do you do with familiar speakers? What about unfamiliar speakers? Or when there's background noise present? And what if you have to learn new information or, or terminology? So like if you go to a doctor's appointment um, where you might not be as familiar with the language that they're using you can kind of see how this might relate to our students a little bit. So let's kick it up a notch though and think about what it would be like to have more significant uh, hearing levels and with that intensified speech degradation. If you were a child just starting out and learning language and learning how to do school, you can see how access and exposure plays a huge role in their development. And this is why many, many states have, um, are passing similar legislation to ensure that our kiddos have um, attained the highest possible outcomes and are right up there with their similar uh, peers who are hearing. And also this is why we need to give some forethought about what visual and auditory access needs might be when we return to school in the fall. Um, our center has created some continuous learning guidance documents and our website is currently being updated with those. I also just um, presented Corin Teaching um, that has a lot of that information there, but by all means, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or concerns or you need more resources as we head into to the fall and opening school back up. So the last slide for me, um, that we always like to share is information about the Indiana Resource Network. Um, we have the privilege of being, being an EARN, I-R-N, and working alongside the Department of Education and our fellow EARNs to provide technical assistance to schools. Um, we enjoy being a part of this group and just like to remind people of the wealth of information and expertise that is available from all of our EARNs. And with that, I will go ahead and send it back to Bethany to close us out. Thank you, Sarah. Let's see if I can get to the next slide here. So we are hopeful, um, certainly that our presentation has helped to give a clearer picture of IDEAL and again, all of the portions uh, of the legislation and all the tools that have been created uh, thus far and again will be available this week. And certainly also how this uh, legislation pertains to you, whether you're an early intervention provider, working with families and young children, or you're in an educational setting and the students uh, that you work with who are deaf and hard of hearing. And really the intent of IDEAL is to provide tools um, and structure to monitor language development in these young children. Uh, and the why, um, that structure uh, should allow for several things. First, parents can have more understanding of what language skills their children should be developing uh, and when they should be developing them. Uh, and with that, it should assist parents also then to know how to ask for assistance and when to ask for assistance um, as well um, as in those, not as well as, excuse me, but in those times that those children are not reaching the milestones expected. Certainly IDEAL also encourages providers in early intervention and educational personnel to monitor language um, using these standardized measures that have been approved through IDEAL. They can be used annually and then tracked over multiple years to note progress. 
And then if progress is not being made as would be expected for that child's age, IDEAL allows professionals to be aware of that um, through the results of those assessment measures and then consider what additional services a child may uh, need uh, to reduce those gaps in language and therefore increase the likelihood of educational success. So as we've noted a couple times throughout our presentation, all of the IDEAL documents and tools, uh, the reporting portal, the technical assistance videos uh, will be available via our website. Uh, you can see here, cdhhe.isdh.in.gov. Um, and so as we wrap up, I have seen uh, through the chat, I know there were several questions uh, during Sarah's portion, and I think uh, Jackie and Lorinda both um, stepped in to answer some of those, but we certainly have some time now uh, if people would like to use that chat function uh, to ask um, any additional questions that may be beneficial uh, related um, to this legislation. I really appreciate you guys' interest and in, uh, as Lorinda mentioned, the large group of you that, that are here uh, today with us. I'll also take this moment um, to recognize or to note the evaluation uh, uh, link uh, and the code there that you can take a, um, take a snip up to get to that um, evaluation for our session. And I believe Christy will be giving the ending session code. Yes, I just wanted to give, there's a question, who reports on students that are not on our caseload? Yeah, absolutely. So whoever is um, giving uh, the assessment measure uh, would be the one uh, who through this uh, legislation uh, is shall be uh, reporting that. So for those on your caseload specifically, uh, you would report that. Uh, and then for those not on the caseload, if it's an early intervention, it may be a service um, coordinator who assists with that. It may be uh, the assessment team uh, through first steps. Uh, and then for students, uh, it would be, um, as Lauren is mentioning, that teacher of record. So I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and give everyone um, the ending code. You can stay on. We've still got 15 minutes if you guys want to stay on and have a discussion or ask additional questions. But for those of you who um, do need to leave, the ending um, code is practices, P-R-A-C-T-I-C-E-S, practices. The beginning code was assessments. So, and the ending code is practices. So make sure that you um, go into that evaluation link or the one in um, SCED, complete that. So your name goes into a drawing. Um, you go ahead and leave this session if you want, but like I said, I'm gonna keep it open. Um, as, and I guess I should have said, we wanna thank you, um, CDHHE staff, for all of your information. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and leave this open for the next 10 to 15 minutes. So if anybody thinks of any questions, um, they can ask. Um, but if not, we wanna thank you. I wanna make sure you go to the main meeting room to for closing um, remarks and drawing. So again, thank you to everyone for attending. And like I said, I'll just keep this open. Hi, I'm Bethany or Sarah or anyone else wants to answer this question. Joanne had a question about um, a student's transitioning to kindergarten. Um, Amish as well as being deaf, do you know if you need to be administered both the IDEAL and WEED assessments? I'm happy um, to pop on. So um, they would likely, so if they participate in WEDA, that actually is one of our approved um, assessment tools. So yes, um, the answer is yes, likely they will participate in WEDA. And, um, and so therefore, those results would then be uploaded into our ideal portal. I hope that answers your question. And then I see Owen, I think you had um, another question too about the recommendation for assessments if or when schools do not report back to buildings. I'm not sure um, 
if you could elaborate a little bit more on that, or you're welcome to send us an email um, and maybe we can um, troubleshoot with you one-on-one. -on -one. I can put my email here in the chat if you'd like. Also, I'm gonna jump on here really quick um, and recognize that we have a lot of their approved tools and measures on our list. In looking at those approved tools and measures, they do include things like I read, I learn, I am, and those kind of state assessments. So we recognize that you won't necessarily get the results or their scoring report from the state that day or that time period when the testing or assessment occurs. So you would just, once you get the reports or it's discussed during the next case conference, that kind of thing, then that can still be uploaded. So there's not necessarily a time frame for those state-based assessment tools or benchmark tools. Um, more or less when you have a speech language pathologist or an educational diagnostician coming in and they're giving the self, C-E-L-F, the self, the PLS, and they give those assessments the day of, those would be the types that you would hopefully enter within that same day or that same week of administering that assessment. So we recognize that you wouldn't necessarily get the, the results report from the state for those assessments that are that administered like the NWA, I learn, I read, that kind of thing. And it's okay to enter them at a later date. You would just still enter the date that the assessment was given during that testing period. Yeah, and Pam, Taylor, I see that you asked about should they be included in ACR paperwork also in present levels? The answer to that I would say would be yes. I mean, this is just more data that we have for our students and you can definitely um, put that information into an IEP. If a child has an IEP, by all means, um, that would be beneficial. So, yeah, and Cindy McDonald, I know you said that you put that into IE, your IEPs currently, so that's wonderful. We know that, that that annual language assessments aren't necessarily done across the state, and so the fact that you're doing it, that's wonderful. So yes, it should be in there, but then um, also entered into our portal. Um, we're really hoping to see that longitudinal data um, every year so that we can see that and kind of compare apples to apples um, and be able to show progress or be able to note if there are any um, gaps that might be forming. Um, so that's why it's important to put it in that portal on an annual basis. Putting that information in an IEP doesn't necessarily give you that synthesis of information where you can look at it all um, in one shot. So that's why it's important to put it in that portal. Melissa, yes, I think that, so there, there's no deadline necessarily in like, if you assess a kiddo and then you have 10 days, right, to put it in the portal, no, that, that is not in the legislation. It's just in the legislation that if you provide the assessment, one of the assessments from our approved list, that then you report those scores. We know that especially with like I read or I learn, um, we don't always get those results right away, right? And so, um, so you would obviously have to wait until those results come back to you to be able to enter that in. In relation to the question, uh, Cindy, about making comparison with other states, um, there are individual tools and assessment lists in other states. So we would certainly would be interested in doing that. Should other states be using the same uh, um, assessment tools, but we'd have to um, see how that pans out as far as what states are able to pass along, um, as well as then what uh, tools they're using. Additionally, I know that Felissa had a comment of with regards to email reminders. We would not, at this point in time, we don't have an email reminding system set up. Um, so you're not going to get an email that says, hey, you have Sally Sue, have you entered this data in? That is not how the system is set up this time. It, this is just HEA 1484 uh, legislation saying, hey, students, children, zero up to the age 11, enter this data in. We're giving you a list of approved measures. We're going to allow you access to have um, the, the ability to input the information on your own through their redcap.org um, scoring system web portal. So no, there's not going to be a, uh, an email reminder that goes out. Um, we're not necessarily going to call and say, hey, I know you have five students on your caseload, but I don't see that you've entered this data in for five students. Um, 
So really the, the onus, the responsibility is, is on your end to enter the, the data at this point in time and working with your SLP, working with others who are administering that information. If they're not on an IEP, if they, there's not a 504 with a 504 coordinator, perhaps designating the um, state assessment person in your building to let you know so that you guys can together collaboratively enter that data in our scoring web portal. And of course, if there's any other questions um, letting everybody who would enter data in know our contact information, reach out to us. Um, the way the web portal is set up is you enter the data in. It does ask for the first and last name, the student test number, that kind of thing, but it's not set up to where we could go back in and change that entry. So that's kind of why we set it up to where there's a opportunity to double check and verify before you click the check mark and then hit submit. So um, just kind of making sure that that gets out there as well. So I agree with Teresa, she had a great idea, sending this information up through everyone who's involved in the assessment process through all the statewide assessments so that everyone knows who we are looking at and they are aware so that they know there we go there's eric know who we are looking at and they are aware of um, what needs to be entered as part of this legislation i want to address the question about teachers who didn't um, attend this uh, presentation. Thanks, Cindy, for asking that question. We will be sending information out via all of our channels that we have, listservs, um, our upcoming newsletters, uh, our social media. We'll also be working with Department of Education and First Steps to ensure that they're assisting us in, in getting this information out as well. You are not, I see the question, Cindy McDonald put it there. You are not needing parent permission to give names to us. It's part of the legislation. The only key piece that you need to be aware of when it comes to parent permission is that parents can opt out in writing submitted to the school and putting that on file. But other than that, you don't need to seek parent permission. This is a legislation for all children, zero up to the age of 11 to participate in this um, assessment process. So good question, Cindy. For special yeah. education coordinators, we did um, a similar presentation at the iCase conference uh, last week. So we're um, certainly hopeful that we reached many of them that way. Uh, and we'll be reaching out through iCase as well to ensure um, for those who missed that presentation that they have the information. And, and many of our guidance documents, likewise ideal, has been shared with the Department of Education and um, in the, um, they have their um, Moodle site. And so we are able to post to the Moodle site and that goes out to um, anybody who has subscribed, but specifically your directors of special education, your special education teachers, um, and then anybody else who has subscribed to that. The current president of iCase right now is Pam Bell. So she's down in the southern portion of our state. And actually, she was um, one of the participants when um, we presented last week for iCase. So she was on, at least I saw her name, so. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Yes, I, I agree. And this is being recorded. So if you guys want, you, you're more than welcome to share this link um, out um, to people as needed. I see Owen's comment. You're exactly right. Why would parents refuse, right? It's, that's why we chose the tools that we chose. They're already implemented in the programming, both early intervention and school-based. So either you're going to have these children participate in the assessments that are statewide benchmarks tools, or you're going to have them perhaps be in speech language therapy and have this language therapist give this assessment tool. That's why we strategically chose the ones that we chose on the list. So we're not going above and beyond by 
picking these more unique off the shelf assessment measures. So our hope is through these presentations, through the information that we post specifically about the parent resource document that Jackie went over, that we can educate the families and make them feel comfortable through this process that we really have in mind the best interest of their child and they're not trying to give them any more assessments. We're just trying to have the data pulled in one place so it's better reporting to help us strategically look at what we're doing to see if we need to change how we're working through the early intervention process or school-based process to target those areas of need when it comes to language both spoken signed as well as in print We are down to our last couple minutes here and just want to be sure people do have time to um, hop over uh, into the closing remarks as well. But um, perhaps another couple questions uh, and then we will close out right at uh, 2.45 just to be conscientious of, of time and that transition. I see Melissa's comment really quick, just to let you know, um, we're not trying to do this secretively. Our encouragement would be that you would share with the parents that also through this process, um, giving them the parent resource and letting them know that there is HEA 1484 or IDEAL, and that through that process, you will be sharing that data through a web-based secure portal, but in the reporting process at the end, their child's name and identification information will not be part of that report. So it's not us saying this number of students even within this district. We're really trying to be respectful of the privacy. So that being said, you don't have to say, hey, I'm gonna give this data to someone else. We really want you to upfront share the parent resource share the HEA 1484 ideal information with your families in your area so that it's not a surprise, so that they're well aware of what we're doing. And I, I think it's important to note too, so even if they were to opt out of uh, ideal, for example, if they, it's not the same or it's not um, opting out of I read or I learn, okay? So that is a, a completely separate uh, thing. So you just make sure that that messaging is very clear. If there is a discussion about opting out, that it is not the same as, uh, as potentially them requesting to opt out of some of those other assessments. And I think we have very little time. If you guys have more questions, feel free to contact us. Yes, thank you, Bethany, for putting our website up there. It has all of our contact information if you need anything additional. And we'll uh, hop out. Thanks everyone, appreciate your time and questions.